Welcome to the Finding the Magic podcast, where books come alive. I'm Tricia Copeland, a fiction author and host of this show. If you love books, finding great reads, and hearing about the story behind the story directly from the authors, this is the place for you. Whether you like fantasy, science fiction, dystopian, or romance titles, I think you'll find something to love in my playlist. Listen in to discover something magical about a book or two today. Hi, Don. Hi, Tricia. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. And thank you for having me on your show. Well, thank you for being here. Today we have Don Sawyer. He's the author of The Burning Gym. Is this an adult fantasy or YA fantasy? Yeah, it's adult fantasy. Um, I hope it has some crossover, but it's, it's definitely an adult fantasy. And it's the first adult uh, fiction I've done. I've done adult nonfiction, but this is kind of, this was really fun to do, although it took me forever. And uh, <laughs> so I've got, it's, it's part of a series called um, the uh, Soul Catcher series. And uh, so the sequel, which is the Tunnels of Buddha set under the Buddha Castle in Budapest, uh, right. is, is um, due out in uh, 2025. And then I'm just beginning to think about a third one. Okay. So take me back to the beginning. Where? What's the origin of the story? What's the premise? Who are the characters? Tell me about the world. Uh, I want to know everything. <laughs> okay. I want to know everything. <laughs> sure. Well, it it, uh, it, it, it it's revolves around, not surprisingly, a burning gym. But the gym is made by a machine um, that looks something like an old time wood camera, box camera. But um, rather than take your picture, it actually crystallizes a portion of your soul. Mm-hmm. And so um, literally your soul, and, and these are incredibly magnificent gems and beautiful, but they're all different colors. And we know right from the beginning that they serve to enhance your character, um, you know, who you are, um, you know, the, the former president of uh, Uruguay, uh, who Pepe, uh, he once said, um, power doesn't corrupt, power simply reveals your true personality. And that's kind of what these gems do. You know, they, they just show who, and so we, she is in this loveless marriage with a philandering husband and she's been, she's a like a legal secretary and basically ignored. So she's pretty desperate when this gym maker shows up on her doorstep and so when he makes her this incredible gym she's sort of uh, elevated and she realizes this is her chance to get the hell out of there and um, he gives her this very cryptic clue on how to find him which involves as it turns out um, going through the subways of new york to find this uh, this uh, subway station that's been closed for 60 years and uh, she does finally track down the gym maker who is pro- his his contract prohibits him from touching another person or from giving his name to another person and it turns out he's 110 years old and he's just kind of been frozen uh in this sort of desperate sadness and and so she literally almost literally kicks down the door and then together they they find and he's attached to this um sort of utopian community uh, that was built by um, extraordinary people, some magicians, if you will, what have you, shapeshifters, things, who, who found this, um, this abandoned subway station, actually subway terminal that was built in the 1870s. And so it was, it's, it's larger than Grand Central Station. But the odd thing about this is it's true that this guy built, tried to build a subway in the 1870s. And he did build this massive underground um, station terminal, but then he, he went broke. And so it's been largely forgotten. But anyway, in my story, people come uh, to, to escape from, from above ground and they transform it into this sort of utopian uh, syndicate community with hundreds of people from all over the world who bring special skills and and so forth and so from that point they realize that he is part of a cabal uh, that and that uses these uh, gyms among other things to uh, spread evil uh, across the world in particular 
the conviction that certain people are meant to rule and other people are meant to be their subjects. And so it's 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 um, inter it's interesting in that it, uh, I, I'm drawing on some of uh, of uh, Nietzsche's ideas of the uh, Superman, but also um, the beyond good and evil, which I think, it, and I think those ideas are, are some of the most insidious that we all have to wrestle with. And this idea that that there's some people that, by virtue of some special quality, are, just, are intended to rule, and the rest of us are just intended to shut up and do what we're told. So I, I think that's that's an idea I really want to encounter, and they do. They counter it, and 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 they use their skills and. It becomes a pretty exciting, I think, a pretty exciting story as they try to track down the leader of this cabal, and it takes them to the ruined bars of uh, Budapest and to a confrontation with the mester in, in his uh, offices in London. And it was fun to write. It does sound fun. Have you been to all these places that you're writing about? I mean, Budapest in particular, when we were there, I was just struck by it, <laughs> to be honest with you. I actually took off some some of my travel to to money to to Budapest um, as a as a writing expense because I said, man, <laughs> you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna use this place in a book, and I did. But the you know this this I mean, it's been overrun. Poor old Hungary has been overrun by every horde known to man. You know, starting from Genghis, you know, Kublai Khan on, and uh, it was occupied for many years. Um, uh, and first, you know, um, by the, the Ottoman Turks, and that was, and then it was occupied um, by the Germans brutally, and 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 then, and then the communists took over. It's just been one thing after another, you know. So, but it still has this kind of um, gloomy but fascinating, slightly um, decrepit kind of magical feel to it, and. Um, well, there's one scene, extended scene set in a ruin bar, and the ruin bars are these old mansions that were um, abandoned, mainly by wealthy Jewish families in World War II, even earlier than that because of the pogroms there. And they just stood there because under the communist regime, they couldn't rebuild them and really had no use for them. So they just kind of started to decay. But they didn't like the 80s and 90s. Young people said, hey, this is ridiculous. So they took them over. And they converted them into these wild bars. Like one we went into had a, a lot of in the in the huge you know, middle of the huge middle of the living room with a parlor with people sitting in it. And there was music playing and the old rooms with crumbling plaster and wow. you know, just wild and, and kind of dark. And so anyway, it was yeah, it was those places stay with you. I think as a writer, you if you if you haven't been there, it's pretty tough. But if you have been, you can really bring these places alive. And in London, I used the Smithfield Market area, which, again, always hit me as kind of a spooky place. It's where they used to publicly execute, usually through the most, you know, they would hang and disembowel and quarter in that area. And it was also, it's also the main meat packing um, section of London. It's the only place in, when I was working in Africa a lot, it was the only place they could, they would sell beer at eight o'clock in the morning. So sometimes we'd get in and we say, all right, let's go over to Smithfield. Because they were they was open for the for the meat packers in the area. Oh yeah. So anyway, all that's fun. Yeah. Yeah, I get inspired when I travel too. So that's kind of neat that so did the travel come first or the book come first? Or you uh, the tra in this case, of... the travel okay. first. And in fact, the the genesis of the book itself was a bit odd because I was working with a writer's group. We were living in Fairhope, Alabama at the time. And I was working with a really neat group of writers, and, and I had to come up with something, you know. And so, it, I had long I worked in a lot of Aboriginal communities in Canada, and I had long heard the story about um, the the photographers at the turn of the nineteenth uh, century who tried to record um, the sort of fading native lifestyle, and uh, and many of the native people were really reluctant to have their pictures taken because they feared that they would take their souls. Right, I've heard that before. Yeah, and apparently it's true. Also in Africa, the same thing. Right. And, and when you think about it, there's something to it. Like, you know, if you have this picture, it's like it freezes you in time, right? It takes a, kind of a party, and this is who you are. Even though you've, you've moved on, this frozen little image of you remains. And so uh, I was fascinated by that. And so I said, well, what if there really was a machine? 
that uh, that took out a portion of your soul and, and what would that do and, and how could it be used for both good and evil and and so that was sort of the the beginning of it and uh, um I, I had a lot of fun with it and I really enjoyed the whole idea. I, I've always been fascinated with deserted subways. Um, Neil Gaiman's books, you know, he has one where a lot of it's set in abandoned London railway you know, station. I was like, wow, how spooky is this? And so I started to do some research and damn, here's the, this station that's been abandoned since like 1947. And there's a line underneath about four levels down that hasn't run since uh, Roosevelt's time. Oh, wow. And so, so I joined the two. So there's this this sort of invisible train that connects with this uh, um, this lost um, utopian community way all underneath underneath the the subway. And of course, she to get there, she has to walk through the subway, terrified of rats. And uh, and so, <laughs> I know. So I got chills. <laughs> I know then. I think we all did, but anyway, and then of course there are people who live down there. Anyway, so it's it's it was fun to do, and uh, I had not done. I, I've always been a fan of fantasy. Um, of course, as a kid, you know, the Lord of the Rings kind of helped me escape a pretty sterile suburban life, and so you realize, boy, what can writing do? What you really can transport people to another world. You can create that world. So this anyway, this was a lot of fun doing it. It sounds like a lot of fun. So, what is the main character's name? The main character is Barbara. Barbara, and, okay. Uh, she's the the woman. She's got red hair, and she's caught in this sort of loveless marriage. Obviously, far brighter than her than her husband, who's this kind of um, not only is he philandering, but he, he's he's just greedy and controlling a lawyer who just sort of you know flattered her and picked her up and married her and then sort of discarded her. And uh, so, she, as I say, she's sort of desperate to escape this wreck of a marriage. And then Zoltan, who shows up, who's this this gym maker. And so he convinces her to buy this gym that he'll make for $50,000. And, of course, he goes berserk and says, you know, you're, you're being taken. And But she senses there's something special about this guy and that it's real. And so the, the book opens with him trying to, to make this gym. And of course, she's kind of fidgety. And says, please, madam, you know, this is not a picture. I'm, I'm crystallizing your soul. Just, you know, sit down. Anyway, so uh, the two of them are these kind of lost souls who come together and, you know, like an atomic, they, they sort of create a lot of vision. And, uh, and the two of them have become quite a, a force to contend with. Does she ever learn why he contacts her specially? Is there something well, special about her? They, there's constant speculation because she said, obviously, there's a mistake. You know, why would why would you come to me? He said, I'm just told where to go. I oh. said, but they don't make mistakes. Um, she said, he, he, they must have wanted my husband. And yeah. he said, no, they wanted you. It was very specific. And so what we learn is that she has some pretty special powers herself. I mean, she sort of jokes around that she's an Aries and this fire image and um, and all this, but it turns out that she really does have this sort of fire inside of her. And, and it turns out also um, quite extraordinary empathic capacities that again, this gym enhances. And so as, as the book moves on, she becomes a, an empath as well as developing um, using her gym um, powers to to protect um, and in some cases even to attack um, but she can also start to not only feel other people's emotions but um, feed emotions to them so at one confrontation um, she's able to feel the sadness of the men and she she turns that to them so they can start to feel compassion so, so she, she, this empathic capacity becomes sort of central to the plot as well. Neat. And so is this a physical gym? Like it's an oh. actual physical gym that's yeah. like a mirror or like a concentration of her soul. And so she can keep it with her, I'm assuming, or does the yeah. other guy get it? No, she, in fact, that's part okay. of the story. She, she, she's, she's, once she, she feels the power of it and, and, and it's just gorgeous, magnificent and, 
it, it's red, but there's like other elements too. There's yellow streaks and there's a black um, diamond with a with a tiny white pearl in the middle of that, and and it's just you know all like it's a thousand facets on it, and uh, so she's terrified that she'll lose it, and she and he says, well, you can put it in a chain. She says, no, I I want a chain that can't be broken. I never want this off my neck, and so he he says, well, I do know someone who makes chains like that, but uh, they're very difficult to find. And so she's one of the um, she, she's one of the artisans that lived in this in this underground um, community called the market. And that's when he gives her this this cryptic clue as to how to find him and the market. And nobody's ever figured that out before, but she does well only one or two has. And so so then and then um, they find he finally she finds him. He violates all the terms of his contract, and then he takes her to the um, to the jeweler who makes this incredible chain that's absolutely unbreakable, made from metals that uh, are still somewhat theoretical, but they figured out it. It's so hard, and a lot of the stuff I did. I wanted. I think urban fantasy is best when it's rooted in as much as you can in fact. And so I did right. a lot of research on metallurgy, and and it's really quite fascinating. Um, and but then she also um, radiates it, and she, she puts the radiations in tune with Barbara's um, um, body vibration. So she can touch the chain, and and nothing happens. But if somebody else touches it, they get radiation poisoning. So this again becomes an issue later later in the book. So yeah, it's very much real, and and then. She also learns to actually use the gym um, to enhance powers and project her powers. Okay. That sounds there's really other, neat. Other gyms, too. There's lots of other gyms out there. And right. It some of them well, it nice. sounds like her finding him in this community may have been a test and a hurdle, right? Like, they had to know if she was really dedicated enough to find them, maybe. Yeah, there's some... I mean, that's what, you know... He, I think he, you know, whether it was in, she actually accuses him of that. You just wanted to see if I could do it. And he said, well, in part, because what you're getting into here, you don't have any idea of the seriousness of it. You know, you're, you're, you're basically severing any ties with your past life. And so um, it was kind of a test. <coughs> Excuse me. And, um, and in fact, she says, well, I, I guess I passed, but the, the, the problem was that she, anyway, I won't go into the detail. No, but don't he, spoil anything for um, us. <laughs> he says, oh, you pass with an A minus. And she's really angry. What are you talking about? <laughs> Figured this all out. I walked in and, and she he says, okay, okay, A plus. <laughs> but yeah, so you're right. There, it is kind of a test and uh, a test of her. And she makes a decision, right? I mean, a big decision. Right. And, and her desperation at getting, getting out of this. Uh, not not just a loveless marriage, but this kind of, as I say, this kind of sterile suburban life, you know, which is so unsatisfying to her. One, by the way, which I kind of grew up with myself. So I guess, like you say, we draw on what we know, right? Right. So what's next for the series? Does this character continue? What's oh, the yeah. next quest? <laughs> mm -hmm. Like in uh, the, the one, the, the sequel is scheduled for May 2025. It's going to be called uh, the Tunnels of Buddha, and much of it's going to uh, occur underneath. Uh, there's, there is, in fact, this incredible uh, maze of tunnels and caves underneath um, Budapest, in particular underneath the Castle of Buddha. It goes on for miles. Some people say they've never been fully explored, uh, and they the, the belief is they found evidence that Neanderthals lived there. So this goes like, you know, we're talking about you know, thousands of years that it's been inhabited. Really spooky. And uh, this is where the evil, uh, the central evil, um, yeah, evil central is located in something called the company. And it turns out that it's this giant organization supported with a lot of money whose in, entire purpose is to um, to force people into believing these ideas of, of a group of intended um, rulers and intended slaves and to convince people of their 
and also to to uh, to enhance and to promote tribalism to try to find ways of dividing people so you know even and it's an idea that i i really do feel strongly about that it's a time when as a species we're facing you know extinction um that can't we do better than getting you know fighting amongst ourselves let's let's find our common humanity and in fact the the group that forms is a representatives of a variety of different cultures as they combat this uh this really nefarious group of um uh, <laughs> uh just evil doers of the but they're also very sophisticated they're working with the most advanced technologies in this underground bunker huge underground bunker and so uh that's that's where we're going with the second book that sounds like a lot of fun. And how do you envision the series? How many books do you think they're going to be? Or is this one you could write forever? <laughs> well, that's, that's a good point. I mean, I, 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 Richard, this, the second one will sort of complete. In fact, it, I have to confess, I actually wrote it as a single book. But you know, as, as you know, so you, not a lot of folks are interested in a, um, a 195,000 word uh, novel from a relatively unknown writer. So uh, I broke it into two and okay. uh, and worked it really worked with a wonderful editor who helped me kind of you know make the transition. So, but I but I, I definitely there's a third now. I can see that now for sure. <laughs> so there's a third one that I'm working on right now. Um, sort of the final showdown because uh, you know <laughs> evil so darn hard to <laughs> get rid of, right? Just, man, they're like uh, whack them all. You get one down. <laughs> So yeah, I could go on indefinitely, but but the third one is going to be sort of the, and I think that's where I'll end the series. But we'll see. A trilogy is always good. That's what and I'm yes, doing. I think one hundred ninety-five thousand words would have been too much for one book. So yeah. yeah, I think that was the right call in there. But you know, it's, a, it's and I mean, I realize that I'm not in the same you know league as J.K. Rowling, but you know, the, those books were like you know seven, six, seven hundred, five, six, seven hundred pages. That's and, true. And, so I said, wow, I can do but no, it was the right call. In fact, I had tried getting the larger book published, you know, and I'd gone, you know, the usual route with uh, um, representatives and publishers and had everybody go back because it's too long. And as soon as I broke it into two and submitted, I had two published almost immediately shown in. Oh, good. Yeah, well, so congratulations. That's call. exciting. Yeah, that, like I said, I think my, I've been kind of somewhat spoiled. I mean, I've had, this is about my, I don't know, 13th or 14th book and I've had you know two of them are Canadian bestsellers and um so it, it I kind of just thought well I'll send it out somebody will publish it and Bob's your uncle <laughs> <It didn't laughs> and this is the first American publisher I've had so just a lot of differences so maybe okay I'm... fun and you talked about your earlier work for all nonfiction works correct no no one one was one our first my first book was about teaching in Newfoundland uh, as okay. a young couple back in the 70s. And that was that was the first book I, and I did, you know, I said, I don't know how to write. And my friend who was a poet of all things, said, oh yeah, man, this is a great story. You gotta tell this story. So <laughs> that was a work of nonfiction that did very, very well. Um, and was used in teacher training programs across the country, which was really gratifying. Um, but then I've done uh, children's books. I've done uh, two YA novels that I'm really, okay. really proud of. Um, I've done a series of, of quick reads, um, which are low vocab, high interest for adult readers. Um, and I really enjoyed doing those, really enjoyed it. Um, and because I was teaching adult uh, adults uh, English. And so there was just no material out there. So I figured, well, I guess I better write it. And that, that's been really, really successful. So, yeah, all kinds of things. Well, it sounds like you're a lifelong author then, writer. Yeah, although, I mean, it's, I, I think um, I, I think I'm an educator who writes more than an okay. author who teaches. Um, the same guy, a friend of mine, said uh, that what he wanted on his tombstone was at least he got a book out of it. And I think that's kind of <laughs> like, you know, like most of the stuff I write kind of stems from my experiences as a, as a teacher in a, in a, let's say, a, an Aboriginal community or, you know, working with alienated young people or, uh, you know, it, it, or maybe even uh, stories I told my kids when they were young. I got a series of 
one called the meanest teacher in the world, which is a series of so you know things that and and of course try, as as you well know because you have a job as well trying to find time to write when you're also you know raising kids and teaching full time is it's not easy. No, it's not. Easy. But now that I'm retired, I don't have any excuse. <laughs> Do you think that was your major jump from writing shorter pieces for young adults to writing like a big series, a fantasy series for adults? I think you, you're on to it. You know, I had more time, it was more, you know, um, and the story just kept going. <laughs> uh, and I didn't, like you said, I didn't have to, I only have, okay, I only have, you know, I, okay, I got Farish to bed um, at 9.30. I, you know, I have to, I have to get up tomorrow and teach tomorrow at 8 so I can maybe get two hours in here, you know, and, and that sort of made you really intent on keeping it short and, I also like writing young adult. I, I think it, you know, it, it's more straightforward for the most part. It's a lot of di I really like dialogue. Uh, you know, you don't have to burden it with over, you know, overly descriptive passages. Um, it, it's 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 a genre that I I enjoy. I mean, the characters can be strong without being um, overly, you know, overwrought. Uh, so I, 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 and I think it's informed my, all of my writing to kind of keep it, um, you know, readable, entertaining, uh, concise, um, good point of view, but not hitting over the head with it kind of, anyway, I, I've enjoyed it. Yeah. And is it written in this burning gym? Is it first person or is it third person? Third person. First person. And that's always a trick too. Um, you know, to make sure that your point of view is reflective of the of the characters, and uh, I, that my editor really helped me a lot with that. That was really really helpful. And well, what is she thinking? You know, don't she just said, you know she's got to react somehow. What is it? <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> and did you get feedback on how a female would react versus a male? Was that hard for you? I, you know, I, I've had that. You know, I mean, of course, I've been married for fifty four years, and I have two daughters. So I think. <laughs> Which isn't to say that I have the same sensibilities as a woman, but I think I can write a, a, a female character pretty well. Uh, having said that, and, and my young adult, adult young adult novel, Where the Rivers Meet, which is the, the the protagonist is a young a young woman in high school, who's just you know she's dealing with all kinds of issues in the community and you know a shattered family and and this really repressive school. And um, she, when she finally breaks out of the school, uh, she, the, the teacher confronts her and she, and, she and, and tries to grab her and she hits him, she slugs him. And I can remember when I was doing a reading to a group of, uh, of high school kids, the woman said, I don't think she would have hit him. She said, I think that's what a boy would do, but I don't think that's what a girl would do. She would just yank free. And they also said, you know, she was kind of on her own in trying to deal with all of these traumas. She said, um, we, as young women, we would have supported each other more and been more as a group. So I, I learned a lot. You know, I think, yeah, maybe they got a point. Yeah, you know, I'm certainly not. I mean, and that's the way I feel about a lot of these things. If 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 you get it wrong, well, criticize me. You know, whether it's cultural or uh, gender based or whatever, and and I can learn from that. When I wrote my uh, second young adult novel, I actually had a young woman who was 15, I think, at the time, because that was what I was aging for. And she was my editor. <laughs> and so she went through it with me. I mean, at one point, I had, I think I had to put a, had a girl putting on lipstick. And she went, oh, my God, nobody puts on lipstick anymore. So, you know, just, <laughs> okay. So, yeah, Fantastic. that was really <laughs> And then and she would say, yeah, I don't think she would talk like that. So that was, you know. Let's face it, I'm somewhat distant from that age group. So that really helped. That was good. I was going to say, yeah, that's great that you had those resources and and took the time to do that and put that yeah. amount of energy into your book. Which and they can never right. be 100% perfect. You're always going to learn something after the fact. So. Yeah. And and I mean, when I wrote Where the Rivers Meet, which is a, set in a Native community, the, the, the young woman, her, her turnaround occurs when she meets this sort of kind of witchy woman, everybody's kind of afraid of her, who lives on the other side of the river, whose name is Mrs. Schwartz. Isn't that a great name for a Native woman? And we actually knew Mrs. Schwartz when we lived in Lytton. Uh, long story. But anyway, she goes there and asks her for help. And 
And the person, oh, what do you want my help for? I don't know, nobody pays attention to this anymore, but she takes her through a spirit quest and she comes out. And then, so anyway, the point I'm making is that when I, particularly when I focused on the spirit quest, I knew this was um, sensitive material and I didn't want to presume. So fortunately I had an elder friend who granted me like four or five hours of interviews and I recorded them and asked her, you know, because her aunt had been one of the last women to go through the quest. And she even sang me the song that her aunt had learned on her quest, which was quite beautiful. And so, I mean, I, I knew this was critical to, I, to be accurate. And, to, and, and what I got was not only this amazing material for the story, but four hours of recording that nobody else had bothered to do, which of course I gave to the, to the tribal council. And yeah, that's it's really still neat. being used, you know, as a resource. So uh, I, I so feel that when you're working in those kind of areas, you must uh, research in the best possible way. That's really neat that you could preserve that for them, too. Uh, I, and then I noticed it was being played on the radio. Oh, and, wow. Uh, which was uh, great. And, you can make a podcast out of that. Yeah, so. you could. <laughs> <laughs> you could, too. I mean, it was, yeah, Definitely. And, and she talked about, you know, because she must have been 80 at the time. I mean, in British Columbia, they, they, you know, the European intrusion really wasn't until late 1700s, early 1800s. So that, that culture and that continuity of that culture was still pretty intact. I can and, imagine. Yeah. Neat. Well, this is a question that I love to ask all my authors. And I think we're going to... I want you to answer it about the burning gem or maybe the series if you want, but someone coming in, what is your vision or what do you want them to take away from the book? What's the overarching either feeling or idea that you want your readers to take away? That even though we're made to feel impotent, we have using bravery and courage and cooperation we have the capacity to shape our world rather than simply uh, inheriting it. Um, and and the, the protagonists in this are selfless and uh, brave uh, and collaborative. And in, in the process, they create a community and a force that um, is, is transformative. And I think we all have the capacity to do that working together. That's neat. That's what I call magic. That's what my whole podcast is based on. Because I always say my character, I like to write characters that are figuring out what their own brand of magic is and bringing that to the world and sharing it with the world. So I love that thought. So thank you so much for being here and tell everyone where we can find you. Okay. Well, thank you for having me. And um, my uh, web, my website is, is simply um, Don, donsawyer.org okay donsawyer.org and if you look at Don Sawyer books on Facebook uh, you can get that's why I try to keep things you know, more current uh, and, and I'd love to hear from people and, uh, and really uh, particularly I'm interested in getting feedback we all are I think you know we're all kind of we sit in our rooms and walk you know type away but what we really want to know is how did it work once it got out on, on you know, to the readers. And so I'd love to hear from readers. I think we all do. Great. Well, thank you so much for being here. And we'll have you back next time when the next book comes out. Great. I'm looking forward to that, Tricia. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Finding the Magic podcast. I'm your host, author and podcaster, Tricia Copeland. And I love getting behind the scenes. If you like the podcast, make sure to subscribe and stop in each week, to discover new authors and books. Thanks for listening. And until next time, keep finding the magic.